Hello. Thank you guys. You already met me, kind of, because I was like jumping the gun. Uh, so my name is Elizabeth Pampalone, and we are going to be talking about marketing minimalism. This is something that I came up with. I'm sure it's a thing other people do too, but I have coined it, so I was going to claim it as mine. And uh, I'm actually a minimalist in real life. So no, I don't just have one fork and one spoon, like my dad thinks that I do. But I do have a lot less in my life than I used to. And it has really helped my stress, especially being a business owner. And I was just talking to somebody at lunch, and we were talking about all the cords and cables that we have in that box that just stares at you when you go in your office and you're like, oh, I gotta go through that one day. Guess what? That might be tomorrow. So <laughs> it might be next week. So think about something like that, because I think minimalism has helped me so much in my mental health, like Nathan talked about this morning. And I want to kind of pass it on to you, but not in a decluttering way, even though that's like what I love to do with my friends is go to their houses and declutter their house. Um, I want to talk to you about it as far as marketing is concerned. When it comes to marketing, we can add and add and add and add because there are so many things you can actually do, but there's actually only a few things you should do for your specific situation. So I'm going to talk about that. And I do have a podcast it's called Marketing Minimalism. It's a two-minute episode every week-ish, almost every Tuesday. <laughs> Don't hold me to that. But um, it's, it's over 100 episodes currently on Apple Podcasts and everything else. And uh, if you like really small, short tips, actionable things you can do, it would be a great podcast to check out. And Nathan loves to put me <clears throat> in what I call the coma hour right after lunch. So I'm going to try and be as lively as I possibly can. Um, I will kind of preface this with, I am expecting a baby in June, so if I do weird things or just am weird, that's why. <laughs> so ignore the weird things, just, you know, think about all the other things I'm saying that are great. <laughs> so I want to first talk, when I talk about marketing minimalism, I talk about like eight different topics, okay? Everything from branding to podcasting to social media, everything. But what I wanted to start with was why my clients, because of these methods, they didn't change anything in 2020. The only stuff we had to change was things related to and connected to events, obviously, and for them to put out a few new pieces of content relating to the pandemic itself, whether they were closed, whether they had new products, whatever that was, okay, however they were pivoting. But the rest of their marketing didn't change at all. They had killer brands that were working for them because they were consistent with their branding. They, know, they knew that their websites and the, were key and that their marketing plans were going to keep moving forward no matter what was happening. Their social media was part of their marketing. It wasn't all of their marketing. And then they had a blog or a podcast that was helping them drive tons and tons of organic SEO, especially in 2020, but even now from 21, 22, and 23. They utilized email marketing, because they need to consistently reach out to their list. Building that list saved some of the companies that I worked with. And then they also cultivated a community of their actual clients. In that time, people really wanted to feel connected, and I still feel like, feel like people do want that connection as well. So even though we do all this marketing, and we do social media, and we have all this outreach that we do, we also have to remember there's a lot of people that are kind of just standing over here like waiting for us to do something. And it's not the prospecting that we're trying to do with a lot of our other marketing pieces. We have to go back to our clients and say, how are you doing? Am I providing you with what you need? Can I help you get something to get you to the next level by giving you something else? So these are all the things that I talk about. Branding, websites, social media, blogging, email marketing, podcasting, memberships, courses, and video. We're going to get to most of them <laughs> today in this talk. So I hope you have your pens ready. They should start smoking in a few minutes. So with branding, you have to have a niche. Niche, niche, whichever. Runs with quiche, that's all I'm worried about. And if you have one, it's not limiting you. I know people say when they're starting this and they're looking into their brand, they're going, if I limit myself too much, if I narrow down too much, I'm limiting all these people that I could be helping. I heard it put this way one time, and this is kind of like my go-to. If you're in a river and you're fishing and you're there for the trout and you have the trout bait and you have everything ready for the trout and you catch a salmon 
Are you going to throw him back? No, you're going to cook him and eat that sucker because he's good. <laughs> and so I work with mostly women clients. Do I have male clients? Uh, yes. Do I work with quite a few male clients? Yes, but they're not my niche client. They're not the people that I'm gearing most of my marketing towards. Most of my marketing is very feminine, as you'll see. And a lot of the things are a little bit more geared towards like a woman's kind of like eye and what they like to see. But a lot of men find value in what I do. So they find value in the content. And so even though I'm gearing my marketing towards women business owners, it doesn't mean that I won't work with non-women business owners, if that makes sense. This is all content that has been rehashed and <laughs> told and said and multiplied over years and years and years of marketing information. Touches and what people expect brands to know about them and what people do when they're following brands, okay? So five to seven touches is what usually ends up making someone a customer. Sometimes it's longer in some industries, shorter in other industries, and those touches can be anything from social to a podcast to seeing you in an event, et cetera, okay? And I'm not talking to total novices here. I'm assuming, I'm assuming everybody knows some of this stuff, so I'm gonna not dwell on this part, but I wanted to just bring it up because as far as branding goes, we need to remember that these things exist and that they're kind of rules but not rules. 48% of people actually expect brands to know them enough to know what they want next. And so I found that in my career of marketing, I'm always changing when people think I'm crazy to change. And then in two years, everyone's doing what I was doing two years ago. So if you have this wild, crazy idea that you think you should move to next, please do it. <laughs> please do it now because it's probably the next thing that's coming down the road. When uh, it was 2016, I was building websites that took four weeks, typical. I was building websites and brands, six weeks, not bad. I was building membership sites with branding and social included, three months. It was like a good time frame. This is what you typically see. My clients were waiting until the literally, and I'm not kidding, the last day because they were going to get like fined in our contract if they didn't produce, like if we didn't produce the content and everything by that day. And so in order for them to avoid a penalty, they would literally on day 31 of our 30 or 30 of our 30 day contract, send me everything they had all at once. And I would feel obligated to the client because it's my business to do all of that work on that day. And so instead of stressing myself out, I said, why don't I just offer this as a service? <laughs> because obviously only, they only have one day to create the content and I only need one day to produce the actual product. So that's why I actually went to creating one year of marketing content in five days, websites being one of them in one day. And so that was a weird and crazy idea at the time, but really my brands that I work with now, they're like, oh, this is what I've been looking for. They kind of expect us to know what they need next or what's, need, what's coming down the road. And if you look at some websites now, you're going to see a lot of people are doing in-a-day services. And I've been doing this for seven years. So if you have that wild and crazy idea, I say go for it. So with branding also on social media, people are really blasé about social media, I feel like right now. Not us as marketers, we're like, heck yeah, social media, <laughs> it's everything. But really, a lot of consumers, and if you think about your own consuming of social media, it's probably gone down. I'm actually only on one platform now, and I'm thinking about leaving that one. <laughs> so it's one of those things that you have to think about your client, their lifestyle, and where they're headed in their lives in order to reach them the most effective way for your clients and for yourself. So along with branding, does your logo alienate or does it engage? I know some people that absolutely love their logos and they are the most hideous things I've ever seen. And they will hang on to that thing until they die. That is like their logo. So-and-so's brother's friend's sister drew it, and it's just amazing to them. And all the colors represent something, and it's literally the primary colors, blue, red, and yellow. So anyway, um, you have to think about who the audience is. I had one client bring me that red, yellow, and blue client logo. Very ornate, very crazy complicated, wasn't the right format, could not really be put into any other format, horizontal, vertical, it was just a mess. And I said, who's your, who are you trying to attract? Oh, we want these high-end clients that like this, this, and this. And I said, this should be your color scheme, still using red, still using blue, still using gold. 
And I built them a new color scheme. They said, oh, we can't change the logo. The board would never allow it. The board spent four months on this logo picking out these very specific hex code colors, which were literally blue, red, and yellow in the definition of the terms. And they were gonna death clutch that logo until the end, and I could not pry it away from them. So their website looks like a hot mess, not because of me, <laughs> because they wouldn't let go of it. And so you have to think about even your own brand or the brands you're working with. How can we get them to see the value in switching and the value in changing? Some clients, like um, I think Nathan talked about it earlier, you're not gonna be able to fix them. You're just not. And those, that client, I said, have a nice day. <laughs> There's your website, Stay good luck with that. Because they're never gonna be able to reach the potential I know they could reach because of this one problem which had to do with their brand. And that was what I just talked about. Oh, I'm ahead of myself again. All right, so I think with branding, um, as long as you have these file formats, you're good. A lot of clients never get these file formats from their people, um, from the people they work with. And if you've never gotten these from your designer, please go back to them. Please beat their door down. Please email them every day until you get them because this is the like golden list. If you have this, you can do anything. You can change it, you can have it edited, you can put it on t-shirts, you can put it on banners. If you don't have this list of, of logos, you're gonna be kind of stuck and someone's gonna have to redraw it, re-vectorize it, and get you the right, the right file formats, um, and then you're just gonna have, end up spending more money. So the first two are kind of like editable files. The PNG transparents are my most used ones. Um, black, a black version, so it's just completely black. If your logo can't be made completely black or completely white or completely gray or completely one color <laughs> your, of your choice, <laughs> then it's probably too complicated if some of the detail is lost. So think about that in terms of if you can't embroider it on something, which none of us will probably really ever do, but that's kind of the most complicated process. If you can't embroider your logo on something, it's probably too complicated. If you can't make it just black, probably too complicated. So this is a great list to kind of make sure that your logo is in the right spot. Then a PDF, sometimes people need that, and then a JPEG just in case some like online systems only require like just JPEGs for some reason. I also make sure that there's a square version and a rectangle version. So after you've done that, <laughs> you're gonna have like 20 different files. You're gonna have a square version of all of these, and you're gonna have a rectangle version of all of these. And trust me, if you have that, you'll never have to go back to the designer again for another logo change or a logo fix or whatever, because you're gonna have everything you need to make whatever you need to make. And I use the um, gray, black, and white a lot on social media posts, because you're gonna have dark posts, you're gonna have light posts, you're gonna have, in my case, green posts, <laughs> and you're gonna need some white or gray or black writing to go on top of that. And then you should embody your brand no matter what you're doing, no matter where you are, because you don't know who's watching you. Do you know what color I'm wearing today? Did you see all the pictures that I've been having shown on this with myself in them? I'm not being vain about it. I'm just trying to show that your color, your brand, should be something that you portray, that you bring out into your everyday life. Because in most cases, you are the brand. And when people get photos done, and they're wearing teal, and their colors and their logo and their business are red, white, and blue, and like patriotic looking, and their photo is teal. It's like, how are you gonna use this to represent your brand? But when I go out to a networking meeting, and I'm wearing any shade of green, or I'm carrying that big old computer bag with green and white polka dots, you know you can pick me out in a room because you know that's, that's Elizabeth and that's, she's in her green. And if you've seen me online, and you see my stuff, all my stuff is branded, all of it's the same color, not just the one green, but I use the light, I use the tan, and I use my color palette all the time, everywhere. I don't stray from it. I might want to, sometimes it gets boring for me. I honestly think that most people should be sick of their brands. You should be sick of it. You see it every day. Your clients don't. They see it when they see it. And so they need to be reminded of who you are and what you do. So if I go out somewhere, Almost all of my closet is this color. It's not my favorite. Do I look great in it? Of course. Um, but it's not my favorite, favorite color in the world. But most things I have have some kind of green in it, even if I'm going to the grocery store. Because I actually saw Karina at the grocery store the other day. 
I think I was wearing green. Pretty sure I was. Um, and so I try to make sure that that's part of who I am every single day because my business is me for the most part. I have a team and all that, but for the way I built my business, the way I want it to be run, I'm the face of that. So I make sure that that's part of my everyday life. Any, is it, are we good on branding? Is it kind of like giving you some ideas, things to work on in your brand? Okay. I have a question. Um, who here is like, my brand is the best. It resonates with my audience 100%, and I'm never changing it because it is totally working. And it actually, actually has to be working. Okay. I have two people with hands up. I have two prizes for you at the end, so you can come up and see me at the end. Now, tell me where your brand is like. Oh, I'm going to have to fix that later. Anybody got a brand like that? I'm going to have to fix that one later. Don't be shy. Come on, we're all learning here. Okay, if you want to talk about it, I'll be here the whole weekend, like Nathan said. He was, like, I, I'm here to help you guys. I flew out here from Jacksonville, Florida. I'm here for the whole weekend. Pick my brain, okay? It's the only time I'm offering it. Usually I charge for it. <laughs> so go ahead and pick my brain if you're having a problem, if you haven't, you're getting stuck on the branding stuff, because this is one of my favorite parts. Well, let's talk about websites. All right. We need to simplify what you do, Okay. You're probably, how many of you have more than five services or 10, 10 services on your website? 10 services? Five services? Three services? Okay, so you guys are doing really good. You need to like make sure that it's really simple. And I find that a lot of people just keep adding things and then don't really go together or they don't really have a rhyme or reason. And what I like to try and do is think, if you have multiple audiences, maybe you have like your beginners that are coming to you and then you have your more advanced people or, and then you have your like power users that are coming to you or you have your like segments of your audience. They're all business owners maybe. They're all um, health professionals, whatever that is, right? But there's like these segments within that main audience. You want to make sure that when they get to that page, they know exactly where to go. They can get exactly what they need from you. It's going to make sure that more sales happen. For example, when you go to a realtor's website, what do they say on their website? They say, go here for buyers and go here for sellers, right? They're telling you, you pick who you are, you self-designate, and then go to the right page. Because if you're a seller and you go to the buyer's page, it's not going to do anything for you. It's not going to help you. But if you're a seller and you go to the seller page, it's speaking directly to you curb appeal, want more money for your sale. Now, if you're a buyer and you go to the seller's page and then the realtor's talking about, we're going to get you more money for your sale. You're like, hmm, I don't want to pay more money for my sale, for the sale, right? So you're reading the wrong information because that realtor might be selling a different, per, different realtor's house and they're like, we're going to get you the best deal. We're going to, right? So they're trying to speak to you in the language that you need to hear for what you're trying to accomplish. Not that they're being double-minded, but they're really just speaking to the audience. So making sure that your, your specific services speak to the specific audience and help people self-designate right when they come to your homepage. Defining the target market is really important. We talked about that in the branding section. It's kind of throughout everything. Um, <clears throat> when I do talks, I do some score talks with um, like score, score National. And every time I do a talk, whether I'm talking about social media or websites or whatever, we always start with like three branding slides because I'm like, no, we're, we're going over this again. <laughs> you need to remember that this is important. And so this is kind of that repeat of that branding slide. Who is that market? Who are we talking to? If we don't have anything that's really simple, people are just going to leave the page or they're going to not understand or they're not going to see how they fit in to exactly what you're doing. And then your website does need to do something. I know we've talked a little bit about in here today websites that are really pretty versus ones that actually do stuff. And I feel like <clears throat> even if your website is really pretty and does like looks really nice, it actually has to accomplish a function for you. This is an employee. Your website is an employee of yours. Why isn't it working harder? Why isn't it doing more? And if you go to any if I went to any website right now, would I be able to do the thing you want me to do? doing a talk on usability tomorrow, so you should come to that. <laughs> We're going to test everybody's website in that one. 
Um, the other thing about your website is, is it protected? There's a lot of really fun people out there that like to per peruse websites, find the ones that don't have privacy policies, find the ones that don't have terms and conditions or disclaimers, and then call the lawyers. Literally, there's people that are hired to do this. Call a group of lawyers. The lawyers are basically going to sue you because so-and-so couldn't find a privacy policy on your website, blah, blah, blah. Some of these things are not required by law, but privacy policies are. There's a whole thing on that. There's also state laws versus federal laws. You can look it up for like your specific thing. But there's ways of getting really quick and easy insurance, basically, on these kind of things. There's, um, I have a whole toolkit on like different softwares that I use. And one of them is like 100 bucks a year, privacy policy done, put some code on your website, don't touch it again. And they automatically update it for every privacy policy thing that changes. Because the laws change as much as Google changes their algorithm and their underpants. So you do want it to be updated with that. But I don't want anybody to get sued. And so every client, I say, you can pay 99 bucks a year or you're on your own. And then they choose. Some choose to do it, some choose not to. But the ones that choose to do it are like, for 99 bucks a year, uh, yeah, let me just do this. And then with the websites, there's SEO. Uh, I call it the myth, the madness, and the legend because I feel like because Google changes their algorithm as much as they change their underpants, like it's just one of those things that is almost this moving target that's impossible to grasp. And I know a bunch of stuff was leaked out a, like a week ago about their algorithm and blah, blah, blah. And I know all the nerds get into that because I kind of do too, but at the same time, for like the practical use of SEO, organic is still the thing that's working. It just is. And if you're an SEO person, don't do the messenger, okay? <laughs> but it's really one of those things when it comes down to like clients and their needs and like users and their needs, we have to look at it on a kind of a level playing field. Organic is what's working. So I try not to stress my clients out with the extra stuff because if they want to go that extra mile, they can pay that extra money and go that extra mile with a firm that's going to do that for them. That's, that's like, that's their whole deal is SEO. But for me and for my clients, I want to give them, you could do all this SEO stuff, but is it what you should be doing right now to get yourself into a place where you can afford all that extra stuff? So I try to tell people, let's work on the organic ones first. And then as you grow, then you'll have the money to actually invest into the things and kind of run with the big dogs in that regard. Same with PPC, <laughs> um, it's an elusive mistress, I call it, because it's definitely another one of those things where it's a moving target. And for most small businesses, they can't afford to keep up. They just cannot. And so I try to make sure that they understand that it's not a requirement that they do all this extra SEO stuff and pay all this money. Some, some firms are charging, like local small firms that really don't know what they're doing, are charging like $700 a month for some of this stuff. In addition to the pay-per-click stuff, in addition to the ad spend. And it's like, some of these small businesses don't even have that. They are just trying to get themselves into a position where they can have that. So I try to give people that, here's the baseline, here's the minimalist approach to this, and you can still be successful. I'll just be honest, never done any paid SEO. I've never done a lot myself on it because I just don't have time. And I've never done any pay-per-click, and I've been just fine. <laughs> All right, so let's move into social media. Can anybody tell me what the number one reason for having social media would be? Engagement is an option, okay. Anybody else? Selling. Selling. Branding. 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 Sort of a narrow audience. Okay, so like awareness. Yeah. Anybody else? Like focused, right, mm -hmm. focused awareness, okay, anything else? Community. Okay, community. FOMO. FOMO, <laughs> that's a good one, I like that one. All right, this is my number one reason for using social media. Authority. I'm just trying to drive traffic to my website. Because where do my sales happen? Somebody said selling, when, where do my sales actually happen? Selling, selling, right. So, but, but where did that, where does that sale actually happen though? They don't actually sell 
Now, you can argue with me that Facebook has a, a place where you can put a product and you can actually put your card into Facebook. Most people aren't doing that, though. They're selling on Facebook or they're selling on Instagram or they're selling on any kind of platform, TikTok, whatever. But what happens, to even Pinterest, you're clicking a link, you're leaving the platform, you're going to a website. So really, if we boil it all down, minimalistic style, the number one reason for having social media is to drive traffic to your or a website. Should be yours because you should get all that traffic and all the extra SEO that comes with that and all the extra clicks. So social media doesn't have to be this amalgamous thing that we just have to, well, it's community and it's, it's awareness and it's all these things. It can be those things. Again, we can do anything with marketing with social media, but does it have to be that right now? And I don't think so. I think the main thing is let's get the traffic to your website. And how do we do that? Well, we need to know what platform is the best for you. This is actually, um, these slides I'm going to show you next are actually on my website. You can go to um, getabsolutemarketing.com forward slash free. I'll show the link at the end as well. And you can get this, this whole like piece of the slides here. Um, Facebook is more women than men, older millennials. People spend 30 minutes a day and the half-life of a post is 30 minutes. Does everybody know what a half-life of a post is? I'm going to explain that. Let me talk about YouTube first, and then we'll go back. YouTube is more men than women, reaches more people in the 18 to 49 category than cable television. They are the second largest search engine because Google owns them, and most people spend around 48 minutes a day on YouTube. Half life of a post is six days. Half life of a post is essentially the time that the post, what I call, lives on a feed for someone to see. So when you post something on Facebook, because of the amount of posts that are being pushed out and the amount of content that's being created there, basically your post gets posted. It lives on feeds of followers and non-followers alike for 30 minutes by itself unless it's commented on, liked, shared, etc., then it kind of gets another like maybe 20 or 30 minutes extra added to its time limit on the feeds. Then once that time is up and nothing has happened to make it stay, it basically goes back to your wall or to your profile and just sits there and then gets pushed down every time you post. So these half-lifes happen on every platform. YouTube is six days. The reason is because the average posting schedule for YouTube, because it's longer form content typically, takes longer to produce, is four to ten days. So people are posting every four days, every seven days, every ten days. That's the average. So the six days is kind of in the middle there. And if the, when you go to your YouTube page and you've watched all these videos, you probably are seeing videos that someone posted three, four, five, six, seven days ago. That's the half-life of those posts. They were posted a little while ago, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry, sorry. Um, on Instagram and Twitter, we actually have the kind of kids version, I feel like. These like Facebook and YouTube are like the mom and dad. <laughs> um, majority women is on Instagram, majority men is on Twitter. You could argue these points, but this is what 2023 statistics are showing. Um, most users are under 35 in both categories. You could argue that point too, but that's not what the actual data says. People are really following more brands versus individuals on and, um, Instagram. And with Instagram, they're spending 30 minutes-ish a day. And the half-life of a post is 19 hours. So it's living on the feeds for about a day. Twitter, people spend 30 minutes a day scrolling, tweeting, whatever. Half life of a post is 21 minutes. And if you think about the time it takes to produce content for YouTube and the time it takes to produce a tweet, <laughs> you can see the difference there. You can see why YouTube is like four to 10 days is a posting interval. And Twitter is you get 21 minutes on the feeds because there's so many people tweeting, especially live tweeting specific events, things happening. There's just so much content being forced into the platform. There's not enough time to show it all. So 
Um, this is where we are with these two. Here's the other, this is more the mom and dad, maybe, maybe the grandparents at this point, I don't know. Um, this is Pinterest and LinkedIn. These are actually my two favorite platforms right now for creators and for like, I would say like service, a lot of service providers use these. <clears throat> Pinterest is majority women, 18 to 69. People are actually 10% more likely to purchase a physical or a digital product on, if they've seen it on Pinterest. They're only spending about 15 minutes a day on Pinterest because it's more of like a search engine to do some research versus like a platform you just kind of scroll endlessly. So very overwhelming if you try to do that. So I see that people are just trying to like look, see what they need, get it, pin it, and then come back for it later. 153,000 hours is the average half-life of a post on Pinterest. The reason this is so long, it's several months by the way, um, the reason this is so long is because you, when you pin something, it gets repinned almost immediately, but not by anything you did. There are so many people pinning and looking for specific things that they're repinning things so fast. So instead of like with Facebook where you have to be seen by kind of your followers or whatever, with Pinterest, it's just out there. It's just kind of wild west out there. And they're changing their algorithms a little bit, so this might be changing soon, but for right now, you pin something, someone repins it. It's like the game you play with the fa the fading balloon, right? The balloon that's like almost touching the ground and then you like pop it up and somebody else comes along and they pop it up and it stays in the air as long as somebody keeps, you know, hitting it into the air. So that's what the pinning is like. And that can go on for months and months and months with one pin. You don't even have to repin it or repost it. It's one time. So I like this platform for products and service-based products, not service, but like um, digital products. It's less useful for services, especially local. It's a little harder. It's also great for blogs, podcasts, any kind of content sharing um, where you really want that to be out there for quite a while. LinkedIn, it's actually evenly men and women. They are less likely to use other platforms. Case in point, it's the only social media that I have. Um, most users spend basically the time they need on it. If they need to be there for an hour to do research, to, to meet people, to connect, they'll be there for an hour. If they only want to be on there for one minute to find one person's email or phone number or name, that's as long as they'll be there. So there's no guarantee of like how long they're actually staying on the platform. Um, and the halfway for the post right now is 24 hours, but that is shortening. I think we're going to get to 20 hours by the end of the year. TikTok, everybody's favorite platform to hate. More, men, more women than men, 18 to 34, so it's a younger platform. Most users spend around 52 uh, minutes a day. Half-life of a post, zero minutes, unless it's viral. Literally. It doesn't live in the feeds at all because of the amount of content and the types of the way that their algorithm works and the types of content that's being pushed around and in what like for you pages and what categories and things like that. Your post doesn't live very long. Um, and there's also some security issues that I've seen um, and that's kind of a personal up to you kind of thing, but I just like to put it in there so you can research it for yourself and see if there's something you would wanna put out your content on. Social media, did anybody learn anything? Like one thing maybe? Okay, at least one thing is all I care about. <laughs> as long as you learn one thing. Because I like to fire hose it at you, and then this will be on video. You can watch it back later, okay? Um, blogging. Let's talk about blogging. How many of you actually blog right now? Okay, regularly? Okay, less of you, I thought so. Um, this is one of the hardest things to do because a lot of people don't take the time to write. It just takes time. I don't take the time to write, I'm be honest, okay? Like, it just takes forever. For me, I'd rather say something than write it down. So I usually end up podcasting versus blogging. So I would encourage you to look into that instead. If you're like not a good, like, you're like, I'm not a good writer. You probably are, but you're probably just a better speaker. Okay. So if you are a better speaker like me, then you will probably enjoy podcasting. Easy, it'd be easier for you. Um, but if I do blog, this is the format that I use. It's very, very simple. Title, got to be catchy. Text, call to action photo, date and time, and that's it. And you probably have a bajillion topics in your notes that you could write on right now. 
<laughs> Nathan had his someday task list. I have like an entire Google Notes form like of like over 100 topics that I could possibly blog on or do a podcast on. And I'm like slowly weeding through them, like slowly. Um, I actually am in the middle of writing a course on how to blog in 10 minutes a day or less. And I'm also do, I also have a couple other things, but I have some free stuff on this on my website too. Some of these like formats um, that I use. And then as long as you're automating your posts and using your RSS feeds correctly, they can go out to your social by itself. It can go out to your email by itself. And then you have ready-made content that's been sent out and you didn't have to do anything except write the post and put it up. That should only take you probably about 20 to 30 minutes total <clears throat> to do all of that, to get all of this written, to have all these pieces put together and put it on your website and then let the rest, the RSS do the rest of the work. Um, can you write nine sentences? Come on, interact, interact. <laughs> you can write nine sentences, right? I mean, anybody can do that, right? Three sentences, three paragraphs, done. That is literally enough for a blog post. So why aren't you writing one? Like right now. No, I'm just kidding. Um, usually when I do a blogging session, I'm like, okay, and now I'm done talking. You're going to write a blog post. You might write three. Um, but I've actually seen that Seth Godin, everybody knows who he is, right? World famous marketer. Woo -hoo. He wrote blogs on his um, blog like years ago that were one sentence. I'm like, dude, you're tweeting on your blog. Uh, okay, if that's what you want to do. But it doesn't, there's no rules. People think, well, you have to write 500 words because Google wants that. <clears throat> Everything that I do, social media, website stuff, blogging, <clears throat> it's all algorithm proof. I'm not here to play to an algorithm. Why should I play their game? I'm never going to beat them. I'm never going to beat the big guys either. They're paying too much money that I don't have. So why don't I just play my own game and get my own clients my way? And that's what I do with my clients. So all this stuff is algorithm proof. So throw out kind of the ideas that have come into our thinking of, we have to do it this way. No, why? It doesn't have to work that way. I've never played by those rules, and it's been fine. I have been in business for 15 years. I'm kind of here to tell you, it works. Go ahead, do it. Do it your way. You don't have to follow all the rules. There are some rules you need to follow, but not all of them, okay? So email marketing. How many of you are doing active email marketing right now? Okay. I did not want to blow up the media guy's ear with my coughing. I'm sorry. Um, how many of you check your email first thing in the morning? More people than are sending out emails. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so if you're checking your email, if you're one of these one in five people that check your email first thing in the morning, like me, then you are the audience. Do you know when I send my emails out? 5.30 a.m., is it me doing it right then? No. People are like, oh my gosh, you were up so early. I'm like, no, I was probably in bed. I was probably asleep. But I have set it up to automate. All my blog posts go out, 5.30 a.m. Because what do people do when they get up? Check their email. It's just a fact of life. This is what people do. So I want to capitalize on that audience, that first thing in the inbox. 55% of people check their email before they start work. So that's before 9. So why aren't you capitalizing on this? How many of you think you can send too many emails? Wrong answer. You can't. If your audience thinks you're sending too many emails, they're not your people. Too many is how many for you? I have sent, because it calculates like your list times how many emails you've sent, right? And then that's how many emails have gone out. Um, I send probably two to three a week. But sometimes they're segmented. Sometimes it's not to the whole list. Sometimes it's to just the clients. Sometimes it's to the prospects. There's just, there's so many ways you can do it. And, I, and in some cases, when I'm doing reminder emails for events and stuff, or like you know, webinars and things, I'll send out like 20, 30 a month. People don't care. They'll either go, oh yeah, I forgot to sign up for that. Or they'll go, okay, this girl, Elizabeth, I don't need what she has, I don't care unsubscribe. I have had some people mark me as spam, which I'm like, but you signed up for this. <laughs> I didn't put you on here by accident. Um, so, but people aren't going to care. If they care, they're not your people. Get them out. Clean up that list. So don't, you can never send too many. Here are two engagement numbers. 
I want you to raise your left or your right hand, depending on which one you would like to have. Would you like the one on the right, 22, the one on the left, 0 0.058? Everybody should raise their right hand. Okay. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is the coma hour. Okay. Um, so I would like the 22% engagement, but I'm not getting that. I'm getting less on my social media. I'm getting 37% I'm getting in my email list. This is the average numbers. I'm getting 37% engagement on my emails. That's huge. Those numbers are unheard of unless you're targeting, unless you're sending to people and you're sending them what they want and what they need. This is all I do for my emails. That's it. Nothing else. Nothing fancy. I have a course on this too. Super, super simple. Little trick, the button. You should have always have two buttons. Guess what? They're both different colors. One says buy now or like call to action that's really strong. The other one says you can learn more. They both go to the same link. <laughs> Why? Why do they not go to the same link? If you're doing it the other way, you're doing it wrong. They should both go to the same link. There are people that are just going to be like, let's do this, I'm in. And then they are going to be people like, I need to know more. But really, all that information is on the same link when you send them. They can buy and they can learn more on the same link. So just tells you what kind of people are in your audience. It's a nice little uh, track there. All right, last thing we got, and then we'll have some questions. How many of you are podcasting hosts? Or you host your own podcast? Two, three, four, not many? Okay, how many of you have been on a podcast as a guest? There we go. Okay, we've got some more of that. 4.2 million podcasts registered online. I'm sure that number is more now. This was written a couple months ago. 166 million people listen to podcasts regularly in this country, in the U.S. 222 million know what it is. Most people listen to eight shows a day. commuting, walking the dog, morning run, all of that. So if you, if you are one of those people that could, you feel like, I could have a show, but uh, you know, I don't have time, make time. Make time. It's, it's sitting here for you. All these people are waiting. Um, and your show doesn't have to be really, really long and really, really drawn out. My show is two minutes, literally. Sometimes I go on for eight minutes because I'm wordy. But... Two minutes. It doesn't have to be crazy. Break the, break the rules. It doesn't have to be an interview show for an hour. Why? Why does it have to be that? It doesn't. Do a 15-minute show. Do a 10-minute show. Um, and if you're not going to be a host, you can be a guest. This is how I fixed my marketing problem, my networking problem in 2020. I was basically, I lost all my networking. I was networking three times a day, like all, all over my city. We had 3,500 events a month. COVID hit, nothing. Now where's all my marketing? I had basically put almost all my eggs in that one basket. So how did I fix one-to-many marketing, me to a bunch of people, and one-to-one -one marketing, me to one person, speaking to them, getting to know them? I started being a guest. I have a course on this too. You need a one sheet. If you have all this stuff and you put it on one page, hidden page on your website, the only thing you need to do to apply is name, email, send them this list, and you're done. You don't have to fill in a long form. You don't have to go crazy with your bio. As long as you have this list completed and on a web page, that is all you have to send someone and say, I want to apply to be on your show. Here's all the stuff you need. They will pick you every time over someone else because you're prepared. They don't have to hunt you down for any of this. You have it all sitting right there for them, and you'll get every guest show that you try to apply for. This is the most simple thing you can do, and you should put it on a page on your website. It should not be a one-sheet PDF. Don't do that. That's not helpful. Make it a web page that you can edit and that they can actually go to and grab stuff from. And then, of course, hosting. Great, incredible marketing tool. <clears throat> I like to think about these questions. Um, are you going to spend money on it? Because you need a host, you need an editor, all that stuff. Will you brand it separately? Mine's different. What's your agenda for the show? I only got two minutes, so my agenda's quick. A tip or task or tool. Um, do you have a co-host? 
I don't work well with others. No. Should you be interviewing or monologuing? <laughs> Obviously monologuing. <laughs> My preferred method of communication. <laughs> My husband doesn't like that, but. <laughs> um, when and how often should you be posting it? I try to post weekly, so I do like 20 or 30 shows at a time and then schedule them all out. And then promoting it, I send it to my social, send it to my email through RSS, so I really don't do much. And then what are your goals with it? I just want to share stuff. That's really my goal with it. I don't get a ton of clients from it, but I want it to be out there and working so that it's another piece of marketing that I have. Questions? I saw a couple hands earlier. <laughs> I was trying to get through everything before we had to end. Questions? <clears throat> One here. In your email newsletter, do you usually have a full message or do you always have a read more, which sends them to the website to finish reading? What was the topic of the newsletter? So I don't do email newsletters at all. I only do emails, which have one thing in them. It is a blog post email, which does send them to read more on my website. It is a podcast email that sends them to the podcasting site to listen. It is an email that says, hey, I just launched this course. Go to the course page to view the rest of the information. So do I don't em, ever do a newsletter. Do you embed some kind of visual or image file or anything, or is it just text? Yeah, so on this one, um, I'll go back to this slide really quick. It's subject line, the text, a photo or graphic, the button or two, depending on how I'm wording something, uh, the footer and the date and time to post. That's all I put in each email. And if it's a blog post, I put the title, the photo that goes with the blog post, a little tiny snippet, and then a read more, and that's it. So each email only gives you one thing to worry about. So if someone looks at my emails and they go, oh, I don't have time to read this, I'll read it later, they're not missing 10 other things that I also stacked into that email. They'll get one about my podcast. Oh, I'm, I'm going to listen to that right now. They're going to get one about the blog. I don't have time to read that. I'm just going to delete it. So I'm giving them only one thing to deal with versus saying, here's everything that happened this month. I hope you read all of it. And then they miss something that they could have actually seen that was really important by me just sending out those 10 emails instead of sending one big one that I tried to cram everything into. Any other questions? Question? No? Did I give you too much information? Oh, my gosh. I think we're still absorbing it. Very good, everybody. <laughs> give her a hand. Definitely tell Thank you. Elizabeth a hand of applause. And I have the free Pro Toolkit and all my free stuff. Um, at my website. So it's getabsolutemarketing.com. You can just click on free or forward slash free and that'll get you everything. Do you have your slides up there too? I do not have these slides, but I don't typically make them available, but okay. I do, I will make them available. And actually, um, if you go to forward slash WordCamp, so my website, getabsolutemarketing.com forward slash WordCamp, I actually made up a special page of all the WordCamp talks I've done. Um, photos from old work camps that I've been to, and then also special stuff just for you guys. And so I'll put the slides up there for you too. Yes, forward slash word camp. Get absolute marketing. Yes. Hey, Elizabeth. Uh, I missed the five minute section. Could you go over that just briefly? Five minutes. To make your marketing for one whole oh, year. Oh, so five, one year of marketing in five days? Five days. So yeah, so basically all the things I covered were each like what I call one day. So when, okay. we, when you do the whole year of marketing and content for one year in five days, it's basically covering one day on branding. But we're knocking out everything that goes with that brand. We're writing the opt-ins. We're designing everything. We're building out the logo. We're figuring out the colors. So kind of think of like branding as this big, massive thing, and then we're putting all of that into one day. Same thing with the website. We're building a website in one day, but we're writing the content. We're designing the pages. We're deciding what the... Um, what's going on each page and where it, where it fits and who the audience is listening to it and all that. So all that's done per day. So if you go to my website, you'll see a breakdown of everything that each day includes and how we kind of structure it. Um, but we do that with our clients, and then I also have courses that kind of teach you to do it yourself. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>